access to this webinar is for educational informational purposes only, not for dating services for the Royals. Uh, consult a licensed broker, registered investment advisor before placing any trades. All securities and orders discussed are tracked and monitored in virtual trading accounts. Virtual account prices and returns may differ. From actual trading results, commission costs are excluded. Neither philstockworld.com, PSW, nor its affiliates, or any of their respective offices, personnel, representatives, agents, or independent contractors are in such capacity of licensed financial advisors, registered investment advisors, or registered broker dealers. Nothing can then webinar, website, or promotional material constitutes promotion or recommendation solicitation or offer of any particular investment security or transaction. Trading options involves risk. Visit the OCC website, www.optionsclearing.com to read characteristics and risks of standardized options. PSW provides education and training services that are meant to teach the risks and potential rewards of trading options, and we are not a service that tells us what to trade. We are not planning to any profit. As always, do not trade for money you cannot afford to lose. Past performance does not equal future results. Some results discussed in this webinar are not to be and are only valid on that specific identified date. Your results may vary. By accessing this webinar, you agree to hold the above harmless from any losses that you may incur as a result of the information discussed in the media identified above. By accessing the webinar, you agree to be placed on our mailing list to receive our newsletter. Rest assured, we take your privacy very seriously and will not distribute or sell your information to anyone. I don't know why Facebook does it, everybody else does it. We should sell it. We should sell your information to whoever the hell gives us back a few pennies, right? What do you care anymore? I don't think any of us have any information left that's actually private. It's all been sold and packaged 10,000 times. Anywho, enough of that. All right, so. Last week I was away. We went to um, a little short uh, cruise ship thing to go see um, the new private island. I think they spent like $250 million on this thing. Um, what's it called? Um, Coco. Coco K. But this blew my mind, I gotta tell you. So we're, we're, we go to the Bahamas. We're on, a, we're on a boat. And the purpose of the boat is to go to this place, Coco K, which is this, you know, got amusement park thing and everything. Um, this is Royal Caribbean owns this island. They built this uh, water park on the island. It's like 10 stories high, this thing, this water slide. Um, it's not a big water park. It's a good water park. It's got some good stuff, but it's not a big water park. It's very compact. The island is lovely. And the food on the island was great, and the food was free, but the water park was $99. So after you pay, here, that's a better view. So after you pay to go on a cruise ship and go to the island, you have to pay $99 to go on the slides and stuff at the island. You can do the beach stuff. See all this? This was free. This was a huge freshwater pool, which is kind of weird. I don't know why they bother with freshwater. But this is a gigantic freshwater pool where you swim up to the bar and all this, and it's very nice, and there's tables. It doesn't show it here. There are tables in the water, and so you can sit in the water and just hang out, and uh, they have live bands and stuff. That was all good. And they have the free food, like cruise ship food on, on the thing. They have great beaches, but then they charge like $500 and $1,000 a day for cabanas, which is crazy. They charge us 20 bucks just for a snorkel to go, to go around. It's like they just nickel and dime you to death. You know, I just found that just really, really objectionable. Oh, this is a balloon. You get in the balloon, it goes up in, up in the air. You know, and they got, of course, all the other water sports and everything. You know, I guess it's normal. To pay. You expect to pay for water sports. You expect to pay for a balloon. But when you're featuring on the manifest of the ships that you say, oh, you're going to spend your day in Coco Cay. And it's because it's, and they show you the picture always of the water park and everything. They don't, they don't mention that that's another $100 a person to do that. You know, people are only paying like, you know, 500 bucks for the whole cruise, I think, for the uh, regular cabins. So when it's another $400 for four people to go to the water park and you're already trapped there with your kids, nasty. Anyway, so that was my objection on my trip. Um, it was lovely, though. We went there. Well, there was just a four-day thing out of Fort Lauderdale. We went to Key West and then we went to uh, this place. And this is where I actually was on. Uh, no, Wednesday I came back. So last Wednesday morning I came back Wednesday morning. Tuesday is when we spent the day on this place. And um, it was a nice little trip. I actually, I, you know, living a half hour from Fort Lauderdale, for me to go on this trip is essentially just driving, you know, driving down the road and um, and getting on a boat. So that was I, that was really mellow. I'm going to actually start doing that more often because that's a, a really relaxing way to spend four days. So I think whenever there's like a Monday holiday or something, I think that's a good thing for me to do. And I can work on the boat. You know, I, I got a reasonable internet connection. So, oops, what did I do? 
So anyway, that was my adventure last week, and that's why we didn't have a webinar. So now we have a webinar, and I should probably do something about that instead of just talking about what I did last week. Um, <laughs> well, now the market, of course, bounces back because it just never stays down. Um, I don't think Powell said anything particularly uh, fancy that, that should have brought things up. He had a thing with the Fed. Well, he was reasonable, though. I like that. And I, and I actually like the fact that the market didn't care that Powell said he's pretty much done raising rates. Not, I'm lowering rates. Not only say he's done lowering rates, but he said, you know what? We don't have a lot of room to lower rates anymore. He actually said that. He also said, I'm concerned about all the debt. None of these things seem to bother the market at all. I thought the market was going to tank when he said that. So, interesting. So it's a, it's, it is a very strong market. Um, maybe I guess I was, I mean, look, at this point, as I said, I was probably wrong to, uh, get nervous and cash out in September. I just didn't want to be, you know, I, I just couldn't see it. All the reasons that I that I noted, I think I noted them this morning, actually. Where are we? This was an older one. I mean, I think I said it when we closed out the, the um, money to our portfolio. What did I say? Uh, nope. Where was this quote? I know I said something. Hmm. Let's see, maybe I said it in the, I'll pull up the window and see what it says. Ah, uh, you said, since there's a lot of uncertainty, I guess I wasn't being specific. Oh, here you go, yeah. I knew I said it somewhere. This is generally when we cash out our portfolios. And I said, look, I don't mind holding IBM or something like that, which IBM actually did kind of tank out a little bit after after that point. Um, this was September 17th. And I said, I don't mind holding IBM, but it went from 143 to 134. So it dropped about 10 bucks and cents. Um, I still like the position, but it's just, you know, it, it, it just, I'm just worried about everything right now. I'm sorry, I still am. Um, I said, look, we're cashing out. We'd rather risk Missing a bit more rally on the Fed easing and the China deal, which is what we have. The Fed easing and the China deal is what we thought we would get a rally on. And the rally, by the way, I said I thought we'd top out at 3,300. So we're at 3,100 right now. So we're not even where I thought we'd be. But we haven't actually got a China deal. But I'm, the, my, my theory was if we got a China deal, if we got the Fed easing and the China deal, that was going to be good for a 10% pop in the market. From where we were, we were right about three thousand back in the seventeenth. So we're only up a hundred since then. I feel like I'm wrong just because we keep rallying, but we keep rallying because the market keeps dropping and then rallying back. So you feel like it's always rallying, but it's not. It's only up a hundred. You know, if you look at the longer term picture, how do you call this rally? Well, let's do that in a second. Let me just let's finish this. So I said, look, and so I, I said, here's what could go right. We could have Fed easing. We could have a China deal. We, can't, we theoretically have a China deal because sure as hell the administration keeps telling us we do, and Fed easing's a given, obviously. All right, and then 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 risk a drop on Fed disappointment, ongoing trade wars, obviously, if it doesn't go the other way, a hard Brexit, still God knows what the hell is going on over there, war in the Middle East, uh, everybody seems to have forgotten about that now. <laughs> I don't know why. It's, it fell out of the news immediately. They were like, we, were, we were having a... There was bombings in, of the oil fields in Iran. Um, there is uh, the incursion of uh, Turkey into uh, Syria. And, um, and then, of course, the, uh, the Iranian whatever else crap is going on over there and the, and the Syrian situation in general. And um, uh, it's, it's just crazy stuff that's happening. And, 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 whatever, and, and, of course, Trump's random tweets. So it's kind of funny. All this stuff is still happening and it doesn't seem to matter. Ooh, what was Kane? Kane was 645. How did Kane work out? Did we ever do that trade? We did not. I'm interested in how it came out. Okay, so anyway, so getting back to the thing. So now, stock charts, stock charts, stock charts. This is what's bad. I had to restart the computer and I don't know where my things are. Okay, it's none of the above. Let's see. Stock charts. 
you know who I am. Okay, good. Stock chart. Gallery view is my favorite. SPX. You know, I just named somebody who I don't remember like people's names and faces, but I do remember every stock symbol and every ETF symbol. Uh, anyway, all right. So, yeah, this is so silly. So, September 17th, we were we were basically here, three oh whatever. We were over 3,000. Now we're at 309.5. And I and and I feel like I was so wrong to cash out 100 points ago, three percent. That's all the S&P has moved. But meanwhile, we avoided this. We avoided the stress of this happening. And then we missed the joy of this happening because we didn't jump right back in at the 200 day moving average because I didn't. I wasn't. Here's the thing I wasn't sure it would hold. It did hold. Then I wasn't sure it would break back over the blue and the 50 day moving average. It did break back over the 50 day. It made a very strong move very quickly. So we never got back in. If we had consolidated on the blue, I might have started poking around with some longs, but if we didn't. So we got to here. Now I started uh, a couple of portfolios and we started in the last few weeks um, adding some positions, but nothing major. We're not we're not running in with our uh, the millions and millions of dollars we cashed out. We're just starting small little portfolios again to see how it goes. Um, but you know, on the whole though, you know, we're at 3,100 now. We were 2,950 here. We're at 2,872 here. This is not really that great. It seems great when you look at from the lows and you, you always think, oh, God, we came back so much. That doesn't matter if you came back so much. You know, it's like if um, <laughs> it's, it's like if you're an athlete, right? If you're a real estate or a runner and you do a, a mile in three minutes and 45 seconds, which is really good. And so you do a 345 mile and then you get hit by a car and then you come back and you do a three minute and 40, uh, a three minute and 55 mile. They'll say, oh, my God, what a comeback. But you're still not as good as you were, or you uh, even get a little better. You're not that much better. You don't extrapolate that you're going to do a, a two-and-a-half-minute mile. You know, just because you start getting better doesn't mean you're going to aim and get better. Certain things reach a limit, naturally. Not certain things, most things. Even the university analysis might be a bubble. The universe might be a bubble and not infinite. So it's like it kind of loops back on itself. And we're, and we're, so we're in the process probably of a looping back period where like, it'll contract, the, 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 uh, the opposite of the big bang, everything will contract and go back to like a ball of gas and then boom again. That's what they think. Luckily, not my problem. <laughs> we'll, we'll see if we can get the earth through the next hundred years before we worry about the next 14 billion. Anyway, um, but all these comebacks, you know, this comeback, and 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 this comeback. It makes you feel like you're in a constant rally. But but it's not a constant rally. The market is eking out a very small gain. In fact, this is a 200-point gain, not even 10%, in two years, 5% a year. It's no better than the market ever performs historically. It's so worse, actually. 8% is about the average per market in, in, in per year. So we're having subpar market growth, and it just seems very exciting. And and, and let me tell you, though, it, it's fun if you play it, right? And we did play it, right? We made, a, we, we made record amounts in our portfolios in the last two years. We did play it, right? But I don't want to play when I don't know. I felt very confident here. On this dip, I felt confident. On this dip, I felt confident. On this dip, I even felt confident. And I also felt confident shorting at this top and this top. I didn't feel confident shorting here, so we didn't. And I didn't feel confident going long here, so we didn't. I said, instead of shorting, I said, just let's cash. I, 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 it, I wanted to short, but shorting's too dangerous in this market. All right, so yeah, I mean, so, I'm look at that. I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not making excuses. I'm just going through my thought process to make sure that we're clear on what I'm actually doing because I want to watch. I want to wait. I want to get more facts. I want to look for stuff. And now we're going to go talk about this, the companies I do like and why we like them. But first, let's see if there's any questions. No, there's no questions. I can go right to it. Fantastic. Okay, let's start with today's post. Wednesday. So today, and, and again, another thing I like is now more and more of the stuff we were worried about is being aired out. The dirty laundry, the impeachment, things like that. 
It's all getting put out in the open. If it's out in the open, it becomes priced into the market. If it's priced into the market, you don't have to be afraid of it anymore. You know, Trump is getting impeached, and this is a, I, I, I would bet half the people listening to me right now don't believe that Trump is actually going to be indicted. He's going to be indicted. He did absolutely lie. He cheated. He, uh, he, he obstructed justice. He did all sorts of horrible things. And I know that half the people who are listening right now don't believe that that's true at all. But that's just unfortunately the way this country is right now. Is we get our news from different places, and if you choose to get your news from somewhere, it tells you that Trump sounds fine. Uh, I was on the boat again. I was this is uh, I was on the boat. I was only on it for four days, but there's no, um, there's no there's no regular news. There's only Fox. And so for four days, I watched Fox News, and I am telling you that by day three, I was ready to. to I felt bad for Trump, the way he's being picked on. <laughs> it's just incredible. I mean, it, it, because it sounds good. They make really good arguments. They make these. It sounds great. You know, oh, that Nancy Pelosi, this and this shift guy, that and this and that. They're making things up. And how do they use these people? And and, and the steel guy is a spy. It's like, of course he's a spy. Who the hell else is going to be listening to what the president's talking about? Who who else is following around high profile individuals with 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 cameras and tapes? That's what spies do. That's their freaking job. <laughs> and, and, and the funny thing is, and I don't think people realize it. I, anyway, I'm not saying important. But I mean, the opposition. Adam Steele was hired, the spy, Steele, for the Steele dossier, was hired by the Republicans originally to get dirt on the Democrats. And he ended up getting dirt, digging up dirt on uh, Trump instead. Or, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It was the Republicans wanted to get dirt on Trump because they didn't want him to be the candidate. That's how it all started. It wasn't the Democrats who hired him. After the fact, he, uh, he said he told the Democrats, hey, I got a whole bunch of dirt on Donald Trump. The Republicans didn't want him. Would you like it? And they said, sure, we'll take a look. <laughs> they didn't hire him to do it, though. Anyway, so, um, and they started to make it up. It just was the thing. It's just, he does bad stuff. Everybody sees it. You start finding, you start finding $2 million for stealing from the charity. His charity, not a charity, his charity. His charity, he used the money to buy personal stuff from the charity, millions of dollars of personal stuff. And I, I noticed something also. Because the, you, you cannot think Donald Trump without thinking he's a billionaire. He, in, your, in everyone's mind, he's a billionaire. <clears throat> so every time you hear something like, oh, he stole $2 million from a charity, you're thinking, oh, he doesn't need $2 million, so it must have been just like a bookkeeping thing or whatever. It's like he doesn't care about $2 million. You know, first of all, I know a lot of billionaires, and, and they do care about $2 million. Uh, second of all, we're only told Donald Trump's a billionaire. You know, we don't get to see his tax returns. We don't know what he's really got in assets and debts and all that. Um, you know, they've lied on so many financial forms. You have no idea whether or not he really has a lot of money. He lives like he has a lot of money. He's got a lot, of, a lot of lifestyle. Maybe he doesn't actually have a lot of money. Maybe $2 million is a very big deal for, to him. And that would very much color the way people think of these little uh, crimes he does. Like when his hotel took in $19 million last quarter from uh, GOP committees that stayed at his hotel in Washington. Um, that the, you, you, you could say that's illegal money going into his campaign. That's, that's how it works. But you know, everybody goes, oh, $19 million. Trump doesn't need $19 million. It must be something else. It's all psychological. because then that's So it's very important he maintains this mystique that he has all this money. Because remember how they freaked out when Bill Clinton got rich in the White House? Both the Clintons. I mean, they, they made a lot of money in the White House. How did they make their money? They wrote books. They did speaking and so on and so forth. They made a ton of money. Or, or after the White House, really, they made the money. But the thing is, they, they all acted like that was a horrible, horrible thing that they did that. Meanwhile, what you know, so 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 Trump now, anything he does with and makes money, they're like, oh, it's nothing to him. Don't worry about it. He's already got money. No big deal. So, so in other words, if poor people make money, that's that's terrible. But if, if Trump makes money, he's already rich and it's great. So, very interesting thing going on. And I'm not I mean, I'm not talking like Republican or uh, you know liberal conservative thing. It's just like it's a psychological interesting thing I notice. And um I see that with a lot of billionaires, too. I mean, when you look in the media, you see billionaires getting in trouble for stuff. 
they get in trouble for you know this guy uh billionaire a hedge fund guy like um roger roger mary or whatever his name was and he uh, had a hedge fund and he stole tens of millions of dollars from customers and he used it for, you know used it the wrong way and whatever and everybody's like oh well you know he didn't need it he must have just you know not been thinking about it the right way or whatever like you don't know how these guys are living you don't know what they're doing you know nobody nobody accidentally steals 10 million dollars <laughs> It's really not a thing. So it's it's just I I see a lot of that going on. So much like people are so willing to forgive Trump for for things because they're like because they think it doesn't matter to him. Because I guess in people's minds you're like, well, if I had a billion dollars, I wouldn't steal a two million dollar painting. That'd be silly. So therefore, he must have accidentally stolen two million dollars in paint, a painting or whatever. And that's not how it works. That's how, that's how he got rich, is, is by doing these little petty things all the time. Anywho, um, so, so yeah, Fox News, I mean, seriously, watch Fox News for two straight days and see if it doesn't, like, change your mind. Or if you are a Fox person, watch Rachel Maddow for, like, two days and see, see what happens to you. It's an interesting experiment. We should, like, take notes. It should be, like, uh, it seems it's like, like uh, Clockwork Orange, they should hold your eyes open and force you to watch it. See how it affects your brain. Anyway, so today, back to the market now. So today, uh, index futures, we were talking about money talk. All right, so this evening at 7 o'clock, I'm going to go on money talk on BNN, which is Bloomberg in Canada. I think I have a link over here to the site. Yep, so that's easy. You can find it like that. And... Um, What's today? The 13th. So yeah, here's your last show. They only do the show once a week, so it's here's the last week's show. And then to, you know, I guess at some point my show will be up there. Um and I'm on for the two segments, probably the last two segments. For some reason I didn't get three this time. I don't know why. <laughs> and um and so we're gonna talk about reopening the money to our portfolio. Now when we closed the money to our portfolio last time, <clears throat> I suggested that we take um Uh, a certain part of the IBM money and put it into a, a new trade, which I outlined here. So I'm not going to worry about that now. It's still about the same where, where it was. I think I suggested taking $27,000 in that IBM trade. You can make another like $25,000 um, with the uh, spread. <clears throat> not, not the spread that's in there. This is the old spread, but with a new spread. But anyway, the older details are here if you follow the link. And it's still about the same price, so it hasn't moved much yet because the IBM went down. Um, Actually, IBM went down. It didn't go. The trade didn't go down because IBM went down, but the options premium that we sold went down. So if IBM does come back, it'll be very nice. Um, that's what it's about. You know, we sell the premium; it protects us from, from moves that go against us. So now, for the new money to our portfolio, we're going to have this IBM trade because uh, I still like IBM. It's back down at the bottom of its uprising channel, and I don't mind adjusting and putting more money into it if it goes the other way. Um, we're selling four of the puts for $20, which is a great price for the business far out of 2022. We're buying eight calls and selling eight calls in 2022, $20 spread. So it's a $16,000 total payoff if all goes well. And it's only net $800 to get into it. And the only downside is you're aggressively selling the puts that are at the money. But I'm not worried about that value wise. I think IBM is certainly going to be there. And it was that start of the year last year, so I'm not going to get into why I like IBM. But it's, it's still, a, it's still a, a fantastic company, still on target. I mean, last year it was like 115, and now it's 135, and next year it'll be 155. It's pretty simple. You know, that, that was our target anyway. Our target was 150. Not, not, that we were, not that we played the 150 calls, but just, you know, that's where we thought it would go, about 150. So we said, well, if it's going to go 150, then we'll take the, um, what were these, 145s? 135s. You took the 120, 135 spread last year. So now we're taking the 135, 140 spread. Really not very ambitious, right? We're not really shooting for the stars here. Um, talked about sun power and... Um, we, we this is we want to sell ten. The reason the reason Sun Power isn't my stock of the year, 
uh, I really like Sun Power, but they're splitting off a division and they're going to become two companies. There'll be another symbol. So if you have a share of Sun Power now, you'll end up with one share of Sun Power plus one share of, of, of Company X uh, in six months. That's their plan. It may not go through, but that's their plan. Now, that won't make the Sun Power puts any less valuable because the put will obligate you to uh, purchase. Uh, Sun Power plus Company X, and you'll get paid on the value of Sun Power plus Company X. Um, so it won't affect you. It's, it, if it goes up, it certainly won't affect you. If it goes down, you just end up owning two things instead of one thing. It makes no difference. So for me, selling those 10 uh, for $3 and getting $3,000 for the short put contracts, why would you not want to do that? Because your worst case scenario is you're buying this com the company that's about to split for five dollars instead of eight. That's that's a lot of money off. That's like you know thirty something, thirty five percent off basically. So do I want to buy Sun Power for thirty five percent off even after they split up? Sure I do. The split's not a bad thing for the company. The split's because they want to concentrate the efforts of each division. One division is going to be the one that uh, makes the chips, and one's going to be the one that sells the solar panels instead of having it all be one company. <clears throat> You know, so that's a, a model they want to go with. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just messy considering the restrictions of the money to our portfolio where I only do the trades on the show. So rather than be a big mess, we're going to make just a, the very, it won't be a mess. We won't, you know, that the puts won't need to do anything. As long as they're in the money, they'll expire worthless. No one cares. So they'll never need to be changed. Um, They'll be difficult to close early. Other than that, no problem. But I don't want to have three legs to the spread and then have to deal with, with whatever kind of changes come up because then it would start matter. And I don't want to deal with that. But I don't mind selling the puts. Um, if I'm not for restrictions on my I, I, I say I say that. So, okay, right. Now, in the uh, short term, why did, why did I mention that? Oh, I was, just, I was just talking about what we did. Okay, sorry. All right, so this is a summary of what we talked about on Monday. Do we have another Phil Stock World for Monday? I don't think we do. We have a Wall Street Journal. We have comments. No. Okay, well, I don't feel like opening it, so forget it. Um, on Monday, we had a more extensive discussion about all these uh, watch list stocks, but in general, I omitted the ones that really took off and are pointless now. It doesn't, it doesn't, it, you know, we're not going to get them because they're too expensive. But of the ones that haven't taken off, these are ones I liked, which was Tiva, OIH, so we are all services, Tangier, Tanger, I, I, I think it's Tangier. I don't know. I always say Tangier. It says Tanger, basically. Um, SKT, I like them. <laughs> um, Oh, hang on, sorry. Uh, this is urgent. Hold on a second. Okay, sorry. Anyway, um, I, uh, the problem with OIH though is the Iran co IPO. See now here, you know the Saudis have been holding production down. They're holding production down to maintain the price of oil so that when they do the IPO for Aramco, they get a good value. Aramco is a state run oil company of Saudis. Basically, is Saudi Arabian oil is represented in this company, Aramco. So obviously, the price of oil is critical. And the, and the expectations of the price of oil is critical to what people are willing to pay for Ramco. There was a good article today saying why Ramco should be priced less than Exxon, though, but that's a side point. Um, anyway, so in, if you assume that Saudi's motivation for keeping the price of oil down is the Ramco IPO, after the Ramco IPO, they lose their motivation to keep the price of oil down. I mean, still they want Ramco to make money, but marginally, 
it's just you know in other words if they're gonna if they're gonna collect 200 million 200 million 200 billion dollars if they're gonna collect 200 billion dollars on the Aramco IPO selling 10 percent of the company 15 percent of the company whatever it ends up being they want the 200 billion dollars now they get 200 billion dollars Aramco makes mm, let's say 50 billion dollars a year for argument's sake maybe 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 75 billion dollars a year whatever some huge amount of money um but consider that that is effectively the GDP of Saudi Arabia. That is their entire source of income for Saudi Arabia, for the government. And that's what they pay all the families and all the princes and everybody, even the thousands of princes, they all get a slice. And when thousands of people split up billions of dollars, it only ends up being a millions of dollars each. And I know that's a weird thing to say, only millions, but the reality is when you're a Saudi prince, your expenses are such that you're probably spending more than a million dollars a year. So they all need that money. So marginally, let, let's see if we can find this. Um, get a real answer here. M mail Google. We don't need that, do we? Um, what? What? Not that. Why are you doing this to me? What is a RAM code? Annual income. A hundred billion dollars. <throat> That's crazy. By the first half of 219 46 bills. So basically a hundred billion dollars. Okay. And now we say what is the GDP of Saudi Arabia? Their GDP is six hundred billion dollars. So one sixth of the one seventh of the entire country's GDP, fifteen percent of the GDP in the country, is a Ramco. And then there's throughput anyway, so it probably probably doubles from that anyway. So it could be it could be something like thirty percent of the company of the country is a Ramco. Anyway, how many Saudi princes are there? Let's see, everybody asks these questions. How many Saudi princes are there? 15,000 members of the royal family. The vast fortune is given among 2,000 of them. See, there you go. So, let's say that they um, calculate. So, let's say they've got, um, let's say they distribute $50 billion. One, two, three. Divided by 2,000, $25 million each. That's pretty good, right? So if they distribute half the money among the princes, it's 25 million each, but they need money to run the government and do stuff anyway. So um, our GDP is $20 trillion, and we spend um, $4 trillion. So 20% of our GDP is spent running the government. So if the Saudis need $120 billion to run the government, that means that quite a large chunk of Aramco is needed just to run the country. So, it's, so you know, who knows what they actually get distributed. But um, the point, they, they certainly, certainly, I mean, I'm sure there's a tiered thing within the princes also. But I mean, you know, I, I've never met a Saudi prince who, who wasn't effectively a multimillionaire. You know, you know, they all have millions of dollars, so they all get quite a good chunk. And they just, that's it, they just get the checks annually. They own that oil. Um, so that being the case, so let's say they're, let's say even though they're distributing $50 billion a year, they're doing a $200 billion IPO, that's four years worth of income in one chunk. All right, so should they, let's say that to get this, uh, the IPO money, they've been artificially supporting the price of oil and it's cost them 10 million barrels a day times, um, let's say, they, let's say they, they're putting 250 a barrel and so it's uh, 25 million barrels a day times, so 25 million barrels a day times 365 days. So nine billion. So it's costing them nine billion dollars a year to support the price of oil at the price it is now. So they, you know, they, they've been trying to use IPO since last year. So for at least a year, they've been spending nine billion dollars supporting the price of oil and doing what they could to jack it up. 
Um, so now that they have the IPO and they got the 200 billion, the problem is it's a one-time thing. They only need to get this extra money once. So are they gonna plow 9 billion back into, of that money in back into keeping the price of oil up to keep up appearances? Or are they, and also where would that expense come from? Because now it's gonna be a publicly known expense if they start spending money to jack up the price of oil. You can't hide $9 billion going out of the Ramco. So they're gonna have that problem and they're also gonna have a problem where, and also the problem that Aramco is now gonna be treated like a public company and if they don't make as much money this year as they made last year, everybody's gonna think they're shrinking and having problems and the stock goes down. And they're not gonna want that. So it's crazy. And, and obviously this is all happening because whatever Aramco is making now is apparently a shortfall of what these guys need. They need more money. So now, Keep in mind that $200 billion, let's say Aramco is declining in revenues and the Saudis used to pull 50 billion a year, but now because uh, uh, because 110 billion doesn't buy what it used to, maybe they're only able to get $40 billion for the family out of that. And they're basically, the whole family took a 20% haircut. And remember when they locked up like so many people in a hotel and took away their privileges and then de 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 dethroned them, whatever they did, um, that was also over the money. So in other words, rather than everybody evenly getting less, they just cut out some people entirely, just to bring to the family they didn't like and eliminate them. Um, so that's where we are in Saudi Arabia now. So as I was saying, so let's say it's not like Aramco went to zero, obviously it didn't go to zero, but it maybe it may it distributes less than it used to. So if it distributes 10 billion a year less, then 200 billion keeps them going for 20 years. And that becomes, you know, from the prince's, from prince, uh, whatever the new prince's name, um, from his point of view, that becomes then somebody else's problem, not his. He solved the problem for his generation, basically. Because now he's got enough money to supplement the income of all of the families for the next, for the next 10, 20 years, whatever. Um, and hopefully, obviously, I'm sure he has a lot of plans to build things up, make more money and do stuff. So, you know, it isn't time to, to realize and change the country. That's not a stupid idea. But that's, you know, so, but at the base, that may be, that is very likely what's happening. But that means then, of course, they're not going to turn around and take the, the 10 billion a year they were going to use to augment their income and put it into propping up the price of oil just to make Rand Paul look good. That's just not worth their time. So we shall see. It'll be very interesting, actually, to see what happens here. Um, but anyway, so, so that being a wild card, and all that was just to explain to you why I don't like OIH. I don't know what's going to happen. I think oil, it's possible that the Saudis will stop supporting the price of oil, and it will collapse back down to the 40s. And that would not be a good idea to jump ahead of, I, uh, of OIH on that. Now. GME and BBY, GameStop and, and Best Buy. Oh, no, no, no. I, there should be another B there. It's Bed Bath & Beyond. I wonder if I did that right. BBY, I always do that. No, they, yeah, they did get away. That was, I, was looking, I was looking at the right chart. I just make that B's in the thing. So, um... Bed Bath & Beyond already jumped so far off the lows that kind of like I'm not too enthusiastic about uh, getting back in there. We were loving it when it was down below 10, but now it's 14. That's a big difference. Or 13.50. It's 35 percent higher. That's just not as exciting. Um, uh, and I said Tanger Family Outlet. I love them. They're 15.88. They're a little too Fed dependent, and the and the options only go out till I think. Are they the ones that go out till June? No, they, no, no, they go out far. That's actually one of the things I like about SKT is that they do have long-term options. Um, isn't that weird? Where's the uh, SKT? There it is. It's been printed. Anyway, no, I said they're not the one. Some, but one of the, oh, is IMAX. IMAX doesn't go out far enough. That was one of the reasons I couldn't do IMAX is because they only go out till June. Tangier goes all the way out to 2022. That's why there's such a great read to play because you can sell these really expensive calls, uh, really expensive puts and really expensive calls relative to most reads that pay a lot of money. And um, and it's a fantastic holding. I think it's already in a dividend portfolio. We can take a look. Um, but they're great. Now it's IMAX. That IMAX got eliminated purely because the options aren't long enough. 
because IMAX would have been my stock of the year, but you only get, you can only sell calls out to June. So IMAX at twenty one dollars. If I sold the twenty dollar puts for a buck fifty, let's say, and I sell and I bought the um, let's say how much is this? Two ten, and then those are going to be four ten. So eighteen. 21 this is the 1821 spread is two bucks out of three and i could offset that two bucks by selling the 20 dollar puts for a buck 50. so i net into 50 cents on a three dollar spread that's okay but you have to sell a lot of puts and you're making a pretty big commitment to buy imax if things turn south and it's june and i don't know what's coming out after christmas after christmas maybe maybe they have a bad first quarter so, you know, we just don't have enough information and the time frame is too short and it would have to be too actively traded. And I try not to make the trade of the year something you have to actively trade. So that's where we are. So IMAX failed based on that. I love IMAX at that price. I love that spread that I just mentioned. I think it's fantastic. I think if you sell the 20s for buck 50 and you buy those spreads, even if you, even if you do 2X the spreads, the 1821 spreads, for two, uh, I'm sorry, was that for two dollars even? If you do uh, a two x on the on the long spread and you do one x on the uh, puts, let's say you sell ten puts and buy twenty calls, you're still in a um, <clears throat> you're in a three dollars spread for a dollar twenty five. So you you get you, it was twenty, you got six thousand dollars coming back to you off of a um, twenty five hundred dollar entry. So you could do it that way, or you can just do a one for one, in which case we get 3,000 back on a $500 layout. So either, actually that makes more sense, doesn't it? So either way, I like it. So that's, it's a great spread. It's just the time frame's too short, but the money, money wise, I, I, I love it. And I would be very, very happy to buy more IMAX and make a stronger commitment, but why not start out making um, three thousand bucks or ten, or or double it? And make say, uh, I'm sorry, making twenty five hundred bucks and then double it, and make five thousand bucks. Let's say, if you want to start with a spread like that and roll it into next year, you do very well. You'll do as well as our other trade practically, but you have to do it in two segments. So therefore, it can't be the trade of the year. That's where that fell, fell apart. <clears throat> Eric says, you like some power. Are there any other solar panel companies that you like too? Mm. Um, 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 I think not at the moment. I'm, I'm just running, running through a bunch of names trying to think. Um, no, I, I certainly don't like Solar City. I don't like um, First Solar. I don't like. Um, there's that one in China. I can't think of the name of. Those guys are, are okay, but they're in China and it's too wonky. Um, so no, I don't really like anybody better than Sun Power. I don't like Sun Power because they're small. They've got the most efficient panels. They're the best, so they're quality. You know, basically for like high quality solar panels, and it doesn't matter to everybody. It matters to some people though, and for the people who matters to it, they generally go into some power. Um, so they, they've got a good steady business that's actually growing. And when they figure out how to get their costs down on the stuff that they're doing, uh, they'll probably gain market share too. So I like them, they, their growth has been good, solid, uh, and, they, and they've been a good well-run company for, for a decade. I mean, we've been, we've been investing in them for a long time. And they just keep coming back and they keep improving their products and they keep having a reason for people to buy them. I like that a lot. Can you talk about why SKT is undervalued? SKT can't cover the dividends, so why is it so undervalued? Just trying to understand. Um, SKT can't cover the dividend, is, uh, is that true? <laughs> Let's start with that. Um, SKT dividend. I haven't seen them change their dividend or not cover it. Dividend and history, dividend history. So dividend.com, they're usually pretty good. Let's see what they say. 
Payout ratio, 111 cents. So I see you're saying that their payout ratio is a little higher than their um, earnings at the moment. And I accept that because they paid out uh, 142 and they only made 127. I don't know if that's against, I don't know if they count that against cash flow or um, EBITDA. No, that's the difference because, you know, obviously they've got a huge amount of depreciation. So I'm not sure that that's where it is. So obviously that's what happens. I mean, stocks like this, people think they're going to not pay their dividend or, or go below it. But I don't know for sure that that's the case with those guys. I was liking their financials. And um, I think they're a very strong contender. And where is my... Where are my numbers? Macy's, that's Molly Fool. <sighs> nope. Well, actually, we can probably find this slideshow here. Let's take a look. Report, transcript, presentation. That's what I want to see. 53 slides. Are they freaking kidding me? <laughs> I mean, actually, here I'll tell you, there's a couple might be some slides that are worth looking at. Um, see, they are. I like them. I like them. They're on the east. They're out here where people basically have money for the most part. You know, not in uh, not so much in the middle of the country where they've got problems. Um, what is that point? What are those numbers? Square footage, blah 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 blah. Okay. Eighty-eight percent is in the top fifty MSA or leading tourism destinations. They're they're, they're very picky about where they have their places. Um, they they have a wide dispersion of properties. These are their biggest tenants. So their biggest tenant is Ascenta at 6%, then the Gap, then PVH, Under Armour, blah, blah, blah. Nobody, so nobody going bankrupt is going to kill them. There's no Forever 21 here or whatever anyway. But nobody's killing them. And that's, that's key also. They're not heavily relying on single tenants. Their occupancy rate is ridiculous, 96% occupancy, which is higher than any more REIT, right? You know, that's true. Um, their um, square footage, they, they're getting good money per foot. They're getting um, their, their everything. Everything's in pretty good shape. All these numbers are decent numbers. Um, sales are pretty steady. Occupancy pretty steady. So, oh, and by the way, that that is you know what you know what you see here is obviously their internal cost of going up. Their occupancy is pretty steady. It is down a bit though, and that's and their rates are pretty steady also, which means that obviously if their costs are going up, they're going to make a little bit less money. But that gets adjusted because then they'll have to raise the rent a little bit, and that'll have to flow through. And it takes a while because they're in the kind of business where you've got to be very careful about how you're pushing things through. And uh, even and even if the uh, tenants will swallow the rent, a lot of them have long-term rent, so it takes a while before the new rents kick in. So even if they raise the rents. It takes a while before that flows through and drops to the bottom line because people have to flip their contracts to get it. Um, let's see. I know it's going to be financials eventually. Wow, way too many slides. Um, notice that they they don't touch their line of credit. Um, they they don't touch their financing. They've got no. They've got very few issues. Um, debt to assets, 48%, um, secured debt, 3%, unencumbered, uh, 199% of their assets are unencumbered, which is odd. Interest coverage is very low. Um, they're rated high. Uh, what is this? Lines of credit. Term loans. They have 600 million term loans coming up, but that's payable out of what they got. Um, that's a payout ratio. Um, this is what? Oh, dividends. See, they, and, they, and this is the other thing. About them. They're very proud of their dividends, and they've been they've been raising their payouts steadily. Now, 
in this particular time, the earnings didn't catch up to the payouts. They may have miscalculated, but it's highly doubtful that these guys are going to cut their earnings. Cut, I'm sorry, cut their dividends. This is, uh, they always feature this in their slides. They always like to talk about how the dividends are increasing and how they're moving forward. And there's nothing, no indication here that they've been failing to execute. All right, this is a, uh, oh, is this thing old? Does this make any sense? I'm confused. All right, well, this is the end of 2018. That's not that helpful, actually. Um, but anyway, so we can, I mean, I can get back into it in chat or I can find it for you after, but we, we, we did go over this extensively. And um, the bottom line is that I don't think there's a, I don't think that you actually have a problem paying the dividend. You're looking at one little number and not really thinking about the entire business. You know, whereas I'm looking at the business and saying, okay, so they couldn't cut. So this year they're a little bit undercovered, but they, they've got, it's not like they've tapped out their cash reserves or they've done anything else. It's just they didn't quite make enough money to cover the dividend uh, payout that they're doing. Um, so, so we like them for long term. And especially, like I said, you can see that pride they take in, in their dividends. It's very important to them. Um, it's probably going to be a long time before they're going to be willing to cut anything. And, uh, and there's no indication that their business is suffering such that that would be something they need to do. Phil, how do you think real estate will perform in 2020? Um, hmm. I mean, you have low rates now. I don't see, I don't think rates are gonna go lower. Uh, so that's a factor. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very down on real estate myself. I'm not really buying anything or doing anything. We, um, you know, we have the uh, PSO investments. We're not touching any real estate plays. I've looked at a lot of them too. Um, it's just not that sexy right now. I, I think there's a lot of millennials staying at home. There's a lot of, there's a lot of millennials leaving, uh, staying at home. There's a lot of old people not going to homes. I think senior housing is taking a bath and that's a dangerous sign that could spread. So no, so so I'm not enthusiastic about real estate. That's the bottom line. Um, you know, I, I I think people have just so much soured on real estate from what happened ten years ago that it's going to be really hard to get them back into like a speculating mood and start to run things up. Eric says, take a look at the market. Ah, what's the market doing? Back down. Let's see. Oh, what 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 happened? All of a sudden. Does anyone know what? Uh, I've met Bloomberg. The, the Bloomberg crawl still says stocks edge higher, treasuries and dollar advance. How his cuts are done for now. I, I think it's just people reacting finally to what Powell said. Because I guess I guess because the Q and A is done and he didn't say anything else. Um, that you know he's not lowering rates anymore. This is it. You know, and, and again, I don't see the justification for this market to be over 3,000. I really don't see the justification for the market to be over 2850. It's just, it makes no sense. We're just way too high. So, um, oh, and Trey, Eric says trade talk problems too. So I, I don't see how you can pay attention to that though. It's like, it's just noise. You know, it's, 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 it's almost like which one of my daughters is right in a, in a fight. It's like, you know, they, one says one thing, one says the other thing. Tomorrow they're fighting, you know, you're back in the car, they're fighting again. Not anymore, thank God. They're older now. But I mean, when they do a little, it would be a, it would be like this constant fight. Whenever you put them too close to each other, they'd start going at each other for God knows what. And that's what these trade talks are like. It's like if you pull them apart, they'll say, oh, no, it's not a problem. And then as soon as they go together again, they start, they start arguing. Like these trade talks always seem to be going really well until they actually get together and discuss things. And then they, then they always walk away from each other and go, I can't even work with these people. It's ridiculous. But look, my overriding theory on trade, and again, I don't like to say I'm anti-Trump, but I, I mean, I'm sorry, but that's just the way it, uh, my viewpoint kind of works out that way. I believe that Trump is lying 
and that there are there is no real progress in these trade talks. I think that every time he says it, it's a lie. I think that the Chinese have made demands that the administration is just can't swallow. Um, I think he's doing his little things like he did yesterday, where he says, "Well, if they don't if they don't come to trade talks, I'm going to start uh, retaliating with more tariffs and so on and so forth." At this point, China doesn't give a shit. He's, he's clearly not going to be in office in, in one year. He's got one year. To China, 12 months is nothing. They can easily do something else for 12 months. They don't need him. There's a finite amount of damage that Donald Trump can do to the Chinese economy in 12 months. And meanwhile, he's doing more damage to his own economy at the same time. Also, though, the other thing Trump, that I don't think Trump brought to you up, Trump is taking $7 billion a a day, a a, a month, from the American people in the form of tariffs. He's putting it into a a fund that he then is able to use to hand out to farmers to buy votes and to kick back to GOP Congress people, which he just did. You know, and that, that, by the way, was was considered possibly bribery charges that will get added to his impeachment hearings. But he just handed money out to con- to senators in the, in the Congress. Not not his money, but from the freaking money he's been collecting, for the, the, the Treasury's been collecting for these tariffs. He's been putting into uh, things for their districts and handing out favors. That's not what that money's supposed to be for. He's got a $7 billion a month slush fund. He's not giving that up. It's not in his interest to make a trade deal with China because then he has no excuse to keep these tariffs on. The tariffs are a tax on the morons who vote for him. That's what it is. Yes, yeah, so Eric says China's supposedly blocking on the farm purchase. Yeah, because um, I think at some point China said we'll buy $50 billion worth of agricultural products, but, but we already went over and said they, they're buying $25 billion less now. So all they have to do is go back to where they were. But I think what happened is that the press uh, was was trying to press every, the, the the press was pressing the issue on the time frame and, and what and what the impact really was, and it embarrassed the Trump administration. And now they have to go back to China and say we need something that looks more substantial than just going back to where you were before this started. And that's not happening. That wasn't China didn't promise anything. China only said we go back to where it was. They weren't promising anything. They had no reason whatsoever to do Trump any favors. And, and don't forget, in 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 Z's mind, he's looking at American politics very likely as this is the way they do business. So in other words, he's got to be concerned that the next president is going to be a Democrat who will be angry if he starts kissing up to Trump or doing Trump favors. So the Chinese are probably more concerned about the polls over there. And remember how we used to watch, we, and we still, we don't understand China and we don't understand Russia. Remember how we used to sit there and try to figure out what was going on in the Kremlin? And it's like a really big deal, and they have people analyzing it all day long. Like, oh, well, when a Russian says this, he means that. And you know how Russians are in this. You know, it's there's so much cultural misunderstanding that's there. And I, I just look at it more from like a business transaction. Like I've, I've done business with Chinese people, Japanese people, you know, all over Asia have done business. Um, I just look at it. I'm sure it's not much different than a businessman's perspective from a, a, in China. And the perspective that he's going to have is going to be like this, this country, America, is going to have a new boss. And I, I certainly, and the new boss is very likely to be a Democrat. And so, therefore, I've got to deal with a Democrat for four to eight years after this idiot for the next 12 months. And he may not see the, the difference where, where, where the Democrats are, more, are less likely to be vindictive. He doesn't see that. He just sees that, you know, they have the same sort of, you know, pigeonholing racism sort of thing that we have. They will say like, oh, well, that's how Americans are. Americans are, are, are vindictive and they, and they blame you for this and that. They, hold, they hate their predecessors. You know, that's, this is all weird stuff. But what's his experience? He's only seen two presidents. And, and, and Obama was, you know, mellow, easy peasy. So there wasn't a problem. And his predecessor, you know, was, was you know, irrelevant. George Bush was irrelevant too anything that was going on at the time. 
So when Obama would sit down with Z, it was all buddy buddy and hang out and talk and whatever. But now Trump crazy and and acts like Obama did everything wrong, wants to reverse all, all the agreements that Obama made. Now imagine doing business with a company like that, where like you know you, you, the next guy shows up and says, "Forget everything that we took that the last guy talked about. He was an idiot. I want to make all new stuff." And by the way, do me some favors. <laughs> It's just, I mean, at a certain point, if, it, if we weren't so big, people would just walk away. They just wouldn't do business with us. They'd be, they'd put us in the, the same kind of category used to put like Idi Amin or something like that. You know, so like you don't do business with a guy. You leave, you let him sit in this little, little country and have fun. But nobody's going to sit there and have serious treaties with him. It makes no sense. That's how Trump is. And, and, as, and as a country, we have to. We should be mortified that our foreign con car policy is being conducted this way. Obviously, obviously, it's going to make it hard for us to do business with other countries if we every four years completely reverse what we said, and nobody can count on us actually living up to an agreement. So anyway. Um, so anyway, so there's, there's two issues here. Number one, I don't see any reason that China would have to give in to any American demands at all. And, and, and the Trump administration needs to have something that looks like they've won some concession. Otherwise, what are they going to do? Otherwise, if people don't laugh them out of, the, out of town. Um, the second thing, though, is that I don't think Trump wants to give up the money. I don't think deep down inside he doesn't want the $7 billion a month to go away. You know, and you can call them tariffs all day long, but the fact of the matter is the American people pay a tax on Chinese imports. That tax goes into a fund that apparently Trump gets to spend any way he wants. But it's not really in the budget. It's an, it's an extra budgetary item. So he ends up having a lot of discretionary pull over what happens to it, which is horrifying. And, and again, it goes back to the same thing. Oh, it's only $7 billion a month. Donald Trump's not looking at nickel and dime. It's like, who is that nickel and dime to? Even Bill Gates would be like, seven billion a month, holy crap. <laughs> nobody's, nobody's nickeling and dying seven billion a month. But Trump just goes to the farmers, oh, here's $14 billion to offset some of the damages here. And then a few months later, he's like, oh, that wasn't enough. Here's another, here's another $14 billion. Completely arbitrary numbers. And, and of course, he gives it out to the big farms, not the little farms. So it just more screwed the little farms. All he ended up doing was giving the big farms money to buy out the little farms with. That's what, that's, what, that's what ended up happening. So it was like an incredibly great plan to put all the little farmers out of business. Um, anyway, in 1020 says, I think the lies cover the manipulation of the markets. Well, yeah, <laughs> a little of that too. Because this stuff is crazy. I mean, look, look what's going on right here. Here's it out. When is this? Last Thursday, 27 4, 27 7, 300 points. Then we get back to 27 5, so down 200, up 300, down 200, up 150, up another 50, so up 200. I forgot already. I think I think basically we're up 100. No, no, we're back to being up 300. So we're back to being up 300 here. Then we go down 200. And now we're back up. And so we're back up 300 points again. So so basically for the week, we are now back to where we were last Thursday. And it's almost a week later, so we're going to be here. And your impression of this week is that we had a big rally, right? Isn't that how you feel? You feel like we had a big rally this week. You feel like the market's been very strong. But we were here last Thursday. And we were here on the S&P too last Thursday. We were here on the NASDAQ last Thursday. We were here last Thursday. We were higher on the Russell last Thursday. There has been no rally. Yet your impression is that there's this huge rally. It's an illusion. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. It's like a big giant magic trick. All right. Anyway, did we ever finish up on the talking about the stocks? No, we didn't, did we? Oh, Tiva. Tiva's a good one. But and now so so Tiva fails because of the uncertainty, because there's so much 
weird crap going on with the pharmaceuticals and the opioids and all it is. It's hard to like put a lot of faith in Tiva. L brands, we got burned on L brands. I still really like them a lot, um, but but I, I just could not in good conscience go down that road again. Um, they, they, you know, it's like they should be turning it around, but they just don't and they keep failing to execute. So I kind of lost a little faith on it. Um, you know, I like investing in retail turnarounds. And Macy's is another one. We, we totally left them off the list. But I really love Macy's too right now. But my attitude is if I can, if I know how I would turn a store around and I can see a path to prosperity, I tend to assume that the management is going to find it. Um, they don't. They don't. Sometimes they don't. L Brands is not finding it. They keep trying stuff that's not working. Macy Best Buy is a good example though. When I when I was banging the table on Best Buy when it was really in the dumps, I was like, I could totally fix this store. If you put me in charge of this place, I can say what I would do. And I said I said for well, one thing I would have I would use up, you know, take more of the space and have a store within store concepts. That's exactly the way they went. They went with the store within stores, they rented out space to Apple, they rented out space to Microsoft. So they're pu still pushing the products through, but they're allowing the uh, manufacturers to represent the products in the store. They have a little AT&T phone center now in the store. So they did everything they should have done to maximize their space. So they're still a destination for electronics. People still go there. They get everything they need. They get the information they need. But now they're collecting more. They're, they're, they have less reps that they have to hire, and they have less space that they have to pay for. So all very good in turnaround. Bed, Bath & Beyond. Um, I, I see, I saw the way clearly fix that. They have already popped, so that's a problem. And GameStop also is another one I like. I like General Nutrition Center. They have not popped yet, really. Um, that's one I think is a turnaround possibility. L Brands, not turned around. Haynes, though, HBI did turn around, but then they're, <clears throat> and, and by the way, also great turnaround. I don't know if we should put back on the list. Haynes Brands, uh, HBI, I'll tell you exactly what's going on with it. HBI was doing a good job turning themselves around, but what happened is um, uh, Target dropped Champion. They used to exclusively sell Champion through Target. And Target is no longer going to pay them to exclusively carry Champion. Therefore, it's almost like Champion is now getting orphaned, but it's not because what Keynes is doing is saying, oh, really? You don't want to sell your best selling, um, you know, your best selling item, there's some best selling item, underwear, really, and, uh, and, and, and little, you know, t shirts and, and things that mostly kids have for athletic wear. So, Target doesn't want the exclusive. That's why they had it. Um, Haynes is saying, oh, great, okay, fine. If you don't want it anymore, then we're going to just open up our own channel. So, they're going to they're open up now champion stores, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that idea. They're also going to start putting it out in other places. So, when you go to the Sports Authority and places like that, you'll see more champion stuff. And um, and it'll just push the same product. They think there's going to be a minor interruption, but over time, they'll they expect to actually to pick up more on the champion line than they had before. Plus, their other lines are doing well. So, very very undervalued here. Haynes is a really good, solid company long term. Um, but anyway, so when I see a, a thing that I think can be turned around, I can't. Oh, and Macy's. Sorry, Macy's is also stupid, stupid cheap. I think it still is, right? Yeah, so Macy's is another one that's absolutely good to pick up. So we have to put those back on our list. Um, the biotech uh, label, that's a mold that's like a three times biotech bullish ETF. You know, we're, we're kind of off the biotech, um, um, you know, the early stages of expansion of biotech, but I think that long term, you know, they, they're still every day you see more and more advances being made, stuff going on. So I still think it's a good thing to have. You know, you just gotta wait for the next wave of things to get people excited about it. Uh, Midtown Steel, I like those guys. Travelers Insurance is a Dow component. That is surprising, there's, there's Metal over here. Travelers is a Dow component, pull back nicely. Northern Dynasty is a penny stock I still like. Uh, they are miners. They ever get their permitting, and then their permitting is that basically, uh, <laughs> they wanna, they, they, their, their, their mine is almost certainly going to cause runoff of toxic waste into the main Alaskan waterway where the salmon, you know, the wild Alaskan salmon, that are the best salmon to eat, um, where those salmon are going, are, are, are traveling. That's where their mine runs off to. 
So the salmon industry, which is no small thing. So it's not like, it's not like, you know, yeah, a lot of times people are like say, oh, you, you're going to save one little stupid turtle to, to, to stop this plant or something like that. In this case, I would say it's a powerful salmon lobby. And the fishermen do not want to risk having a mine here. Just like, you know, it's funny, Keystone Pipeline, right? They just had a huge leak. And everybody was protesting the pipeline. They said, it's going to have leaks and it's going to destroy the environment. Well, not even six months into operation, the thing had a huge leak and destroyed, and destroyed some town, basically. Um, they, this is they, they, this is a risk they don't want to take because in this case you destroy the salmon, you destroy the salmon. Essentially, you will completely wipe out the Alaskan salmon, um, and, and and that's not worth the risk. It's a multi-billion-dollar industry that can be destroyed by the stupid bastards in their mind. But uh, obviously, the Trump administration is very friendly to that sort of thing. They care less about fish. And uh, they're trying to push it through, and they've got a lot of people getting paid off to do this stuff. So if they ever get the permitting, and if they ever move this mine forward, um, it, it's the biggest deposit of gold in the world, and and copper and molybdenum, which you never say So it, it's a huge asset that they're sitting on that just unfortunately cannot be mined at the moment. But if it ever does hit, it's going to be a big big money game. Frontier Telephone, another one, if it ever hits, it's going to be huge, but oh my God, uh, they're officially now restructuring. So they, they could go to zero, they can wipe out the shareholders, there's a lot of things that can happen. So I wouldn't get too heavy into it right now. But once they do restructure, um, I'm going to be very excited about them again. Barry Gold ended up being our choice. Cleveland Cliffs I like. When China comes back, they'll be good. Capri Holdings, we were talking about a few months ago, we did pick them up in our portfolios towards the end. Um, they, they've already taken off IMAX, stupidly cheap. As, like I said, it's two short-term options. Uh, also, you got to count on Hollywood's, you know, first quarter, you know, film box office to uh, drive them. Lockheed Martin, we already love, but unfortunately, we loved them when they were like way down here and they're way up here now. So not worth it. Annaly, NLY is a great REIT. Also good to play. Walgreens, unfortunately, somebody decided to buy them now. Um, and so we ended up back at Barrick Gold, which is ABX. And our Barrick Gold trade is down here. And that's going to be our trade of the year now. So that was it. Those were all the candidates. And that's where we ended up. And we ended up with Barrick Gold. And the, and the way we're playing Barrick Gold is nothing crazy. They're at 16. Oh, look, they went up a lot today. Um, they're at 16.73. And we're doing the 13.17 spread two years from now. We're doing the 17 puts. That's aggressive, selling the 17 puts. But why should I sell the 15 puts and take a dollar 50 less when, I, when, I'm, when I'm fairly sure they're going to be in the 20s? I may as well get paid. So let's get paid. So we collect 350 for the 17 puts. I'll show you here, actually. It's on. Gee, where did I G-O-L-D. So we're selling 17 puts for three bucks, 310 here. Um, if we sold the 15s, we'd only get two, 240. Well, no, we wouldn't get 240, so it went down since then. We get two bucks to sell the 15s. So if I sell the 17s for three, my net is 14. If I sell the 15s for two, my net is 13. So for a dollar less net, I'm going to collect a dollar 50 less or a dollar 20 less. That's silly. Right? I'd rather collect the extra dollar 20 because I'm, because well, again, I'm bullish. If I'm bullish, I want it to go up. I expect it to go up. So don't I want to have another dollar 20 when it goes up instead of less money? It doesn't do me enough harm to not take the money. So I'm going to take the money. And it certainly doesn't affect my margin very much. It has a very tiny effect on the margin. It, it has a huge effect on how much money I'm putting in my pocket. It's an extra thousand bucks. And it has very little effect on the net entry price. So there's really no reason to, to not take that extra cash. And that is about it. I think I'm going to be done for the day because I got to go and do my um, that TV show on BNN. I got to get ready for that. So let me know if you guys have any questions, and otherwise, we are going to pack it in. Where did my question box go? Oh, there it is.
You guys can't see it, I don't think, but there it is. Oh, uh oh, somebody asked a question. Eric says, are there any companies that you believe are grossly overvalued that could be an interesting short? Ha, <laughs> um, ha, I mean, there's, there's uh, several companies I think are overvalued. I mean, mostly um, it's Netflix, Tesla, and uh, Chipotle. Now, I haven't looked recently at where they are. Um, I think uh, Tesla for sure would pop back up, right? So Tesla came back up around 350, which is ridiculous for them. And, um, and not to say they won't get back to 380, but I mean, it's just that they're in the range where they're very silly. Um, but they're all very, very, very dangerous to short. You know, Chipotle, CMG. But they came down pretty nicely. We did a, that was a big short in our hedge fund. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that they already came down 100 bucks. I think they're going to end up at 650. I think they're just bouncing. This is basically a weak bounce, right? I mean, they're bouncing off the 50-day moving average. So you, you're falling from 850 to 730, which is the 50-day moving average. It's 120 points. So a bounce would be 20% of the 120 is 25 points, let's say. So that would be 755. And look where you are, 755, right there, 753.63. That's a weak bounce. That's all this is. So weak bounce, a strong bounce would be another another 25 points. So that'd be seven. Um, uh, what did I say? 25 is 55, and then 55 and 25 is 75 is 80. So 80 would be the strong bounce. They're not even close. So they're having a weak bounce now. If they hit this and strong bounce, you still won't know for sure until you see if they clear the strong or fail. But if they fail the strong and then fail the weak and then come down to the 200 and fail that, they're going back to 650. And this is what I consider the fair value for, for Chipotle at 650. And even that's being a bit generous, but I mean, I do think that that's where they should fall back to. Um, Tesla, I think, is 150. So, I mean, that, that's, I mean, Tesla should fall 50% from here. There is no way you can justify this, this thing with, the, with their actual sales. It makes no sense. Um, Tesla, Chipotle, you want to say Netflix. Netflix had a relief rally because the Disney thing isn't as strong as people were worried about. But it, as you can see here, it's a pretty, it didn't uh, last. You know, it's already fading. Because look, the fact is, Disney, Disney did not put like tons of Marvel movies out and things like that. I'm not sure what their plan is. I guess why would you start with everything all at once? Maybe that's what their plan is, that they want to release new things each month. Um, but Disney didn't put everything out there on the uh, platform they have. Uh, so Netflix is having a release rally, but now um, the, the reality is though you, now, now you're seeing that Disney's getting signups and people are going there and now you gotta worry about price wars and there's like five other people putting out platforms. It's, I, I, it's crazy. But I've always said that about Netflix and Netflix was another short we featured last year. You know, and again, it's so much lower than it was. It's like, I certainly wouldn't short it now. But, you know, it was just ridiculous. But anyway, so the bottom line answer to that is that of the group, then Tesla would be my favorite short, but Tesla's unbelievably dangerous to short. You just say it's just really, in, and in this market, and the way it bounces back and everything comes back all the time, it's just very, very stressful to try shorting things. Um, so, so honestly, it's not for me. Oh, we shorted Booking.com, BKNG. We did, we did do that. That was that was one of our newest plays in the portfolios, in the in the short term portfolio. Um, Booking was up here, and I thought that was just ludicrous. And also, we had we and see, this is the thing. This is where you got to pay attention. Booking is Priceline, okay, so what, and, 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 and where were their big revenues coming from? The big revenues were coming from their expansion into China, Asia, but the overseas travel like that. Huge amounts of money they're making, they did a great job penetrating China and getting into that market and booking people tours to America and all that stuff. It's so great, good for them. But meanwhile, with the trade war, there's been a, a tremendous drop in tourism. I hear it over and over again. I hear it from the hotel chains. I heard it from Marriott. I heard it from... Um, you know, from uh, the, from the, uh, the 
the all the uh, the other one, the Hilton's and uh, all the people reporting, they were saying no, not good. The airlines are saying they have problems with international travel, we're not as much tourism. The Fed Beige book said the tourism was down in, in all in most of their sectors. So you hear that over and over again, you say, well, gosh, wouldn't that affect price line? Wouldn't that mean they're going to get less revenues if there's just simply less tourism? Yeah, sure enough, yeah, it did. And I wouldn't have cared if they were priced at a good price and reasonable, but they got killed because they were just priced as if they would never stop growing. And they finally hit something that says, you know what? It doesn't always grow every single year. You can't count on that. So we'll see where they are. But our play was for basically to stay around 1800. And, and um, see if this is even going to work. Okay, portfolios. There we are. So in the uh, short term portfolio, so 42% are right. So what we did is a simple, simple trade. We did two. We did the short puts. We took the 2100 puts, which were in the money. We sold the 1900 puts, which were out of the money, though now they're both in the money. So the spreads in the money. And we also sold the 1800 puts for January. And they're only a little bit over 1800 now. So my bet was it would be less than 2000 in January but higher than 1800. And we're right on, we're right on the nose now. In fact, these are up 90%. We should probably take these off the table because why, why are we gonna risk this for two more months? We have 65 days left to make 10%. That seems like kind of a silly risk, right? I, and, and not that I think it's gonna pop back to 2000, but geez, is it really worth risking $27,000 in profits? No, not really. You know, it's just, it doesn't make sense. Not only that though, but if they do fall further, I may want to sell some other calls. So I probably wouldn't buy these back. Um, and otherwise though, this spreads totally in the money and it's going to be a uh, $200 times two contracts. It's still uh, $40,000. So it's a $40,000 spread. It's totally in the money. Right now it's, it's only twenty. $3,000, so we got plenty of money to make on that. We already made this money, and we're gonna be able to every month sell, well, not every month, but I mean, in, De in December, in December, in September, we sold the January puts and calls. So we sold basically um, about three, four months, we sold puts and calls. We have two years to do that. I'm sorry, one year, we only built one year. So we have one year to do that. We can do at least three more times uh, sell this kind of uh, premium, which is $40,000 in premium that we sold. So out of 40,000 we sold, we're already collecting $30,000. If we cash that now, we get away with clean with $30,000 in premium, plus we still own the spread. So that's how you short. You short where it's just a sort of a no-brainer. And when it comes along, I'll be happy to do it. But I'm not going to force it. You know, it's like when, when something runs up to the tippy top, like Tesla, yes, I will do it with Tesla and feel free to remind me, but I'll do it with Tesla when I really, really, really think it's topping out. And, and if I miss it, I miss it, but I want to be sure that it's topping out because we've gotten burned on Tesla many, many times, and um, including in the hedge fund. So, I mean, it's just, I really want to make sure that it's definitely topping out before we start uh, uh, placing short bets on Tesla and, and, and and where we get burned if it starts popping up. This one was easy though. And why? It wasn't just because it was high, it was because it's high and the news was changing, the fundamentals were changing for them. And, and it would make no sense at all for them to have gone through this earnings and said, everything's great. And they didn't and the stock dropped. All right, Tesla, you know, is gonna say everything's great even if it's not great. They're gonna pretend everything's great. But they are releasing that truck soon. And when they release the truck and everybody sees it, it's not a big deal at all. And it's the same truck they showed us like a year ago. I don't see why this stock would be up this high. I don't think there's another catalyst left for them after that. But that's the one I would keep an eye on. So let's let's take a good look at Tesla and, and pay close attention to what they're doing. So if you want to play something short, that's going to be my top choice. And that's it. Okay, I'm going to save my voice, so I don't want to go too long today because i got to do all my talking on the show and look professional. All right, so thanks a lot, everybody, for coming. We will do this again next week, and we'll be back to normal. And, uh, you know, tune in later. You can watch me on TV. All right, thanks. Have a good day.